they are sent in lieu of preface. The life of hero Deacon Anthony has been shaped by a cruel fate, indeed. It all began one day when he, a callow youth, was forced to leave his father's home and overnight became a wanderer and eventually a martyr. Having first deprived him of eyesight, of hearth and home, and finally of family happiness, the cruel fate, however, was unable to break his spirit and his resolve to live an honest life following the dictates of Christian conscience. But before beginning my story about this remarkable Orthodox monk, I would like to ask you first, who of you could define the meaning of your life? Do any of you know for certain and exactly why you came into this world? There are those among us who choose to turn our life into a gamble with death, while others play a lifelong game of chance for financial gain. There are those for whom life is a lifelong toil to provide for their family members, to feed their near and dear ones. But the hero of my story, his life became a steady ascent to the pinnacle of true faith and the true meaning of earthly life. So, here comes the story of the life and death of Herod Deacon Antony, a blind Orthodox monk. <laughs> Here, Deacon Antony, in the secular world, his name was Alexander Semyonov, was born on August 19, 1914, in the village of Yelaur, on the Volga, into a devout peasant family. The baby boy came into the world at midnight, to the accompaniment of church bells, ringing the call of prayer at the all-night vigil on the eve of the Transfiguration. His father, Dmitry Fyodorovich Semyonov, came of wealthy peasant stock and owned two mills, a water mill and a windmill, 14 horses, 10 cows, and a large family house of his own. He was a fairly well-educated man by the standards of his day, having finished a private school in the city of Sizren. Alexei's mother, Natalia Alexeyevna, came from the village of Bikoyel, 60 kilometers from Yelaur. Her father, Alexei Gefremov, was a merchant and ship owner who had traveled extensively on his trading business up and down the Volga and in the Caspian Sea. He also visited Persia and India, from where he once brought a bride for himself. He had been looking a long time for the right woman. He found her when he was 30. Her name was Ishna. Upon her conversion to Orthodox Christianity, she was given the name of Irina. 
Dmitry Semyonov and Natalia Yefremova got married in 1901. Of the seven children born to them, only three survived and attained majority. Two sons, Mikhail and Alexander, and one daughter, Katerina. The children got a religious education. Agathia, the nanny of little Sasha, hailed from Saratov and was a very devout and pious woman. She taught the boy to read and write, and at age seven he could read canonical hours in the local church. However, he was destined to enjoy his happy and an unclouded childhood only for four short years. The Bolshevik Revolution broke out in 1917 and rudely changed all that. Early in 1918, his father, to the surprise of all, suddenly sold all he owned, put his family on board a steamer, and sailed up the Volga to the city of Chebaksari, where the family disembarked. For another week they rode on horseback deep into the wilds of Chuvashia, eventually halting at the village of Karkeli Shigali, Chuvash for Red Stone, about a dozen miles from the district center of Chemursha. In the village surrounded by thick forest, there was a beautiful wooden triple throne church dedicated to the Archangel Michael. Not far from it, the Simonovs built a large wooden six-room, two-storied house. The house was not so much for the family's needs, as it turned out, the Semenos frequently put up passing pilgrims on their way to Sarov to venerate and pay homage to the relics of Saint Seraphim. Before long, Sasha's father became the local church warden. His mother, for her part, looked after the pilgrims feeding them, preparing steam baths for them, and, when necessary, treated them with healing medicinal herbs and fork medicinal tinctures. What made Sasha's father drop everything and move deep into the forest of Chuasher is the subject of the next chapter of my story. For now, let us recall the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed by thy name, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In 1901, long before Antony was born, his father and grandfather on the mother's side once got on a steamer and sailed to Saratov on the Volga. In the city's cathedral, they had the good fortune to meet St. John of Kronstadt, who gave them his blessing to abandon their estate and all possessions and flee from the tornado of revolutionary change Telling his own children later about this fatal meeting, Dmitry Fedorovich quoted the words of St. John of Kronstadt. 
Spare nothing but your life. Drop everything. Flee from your village. Take your family with you and run. Dmitry Semyonovich took the prophetic advance warning of St. John of Kronstadt seriously. And indeed, by pulling up his stakes and fleeing, he gave his family an extra ten years of relatively quiet life. He gained valuable time to give his children education, to temper their spirit and character, and fortify their faith. 1928 came, and the Bolsheviks banned the local parish. On the night of Good Friday, a group of local militant atheists, led by members of the new local government, burst into the Semenov's house, demanding that Dmitry Fedorovich, the parish warden, hand over the keys to their Kangal Michael church. They planned to convert the church into a clubhouse. He flatly refused to surrender the keys as he would not let the blasphemes desecrate the holy temple. Well, the Bolsheviks beat a retreat and found another place for the clubhouse, but not before they burned the Archangel Michael church down. Dmitry Fedorovich, for his refusal to surrender the keys, was shot summarily. Before he was buried, they stripped him naked and threw him into a hole in the ground without bothering to put him in the coffin even. They drove an aspen stake into the earth mound and wrote, Enemy of the great Soviet people. Good Lord, it's unbelievable. And yet, that's exactly what happened and how it happened. Every word of it is true. Let us pray for the innocent martyr Dmitri and for the repose of his soul. His soul shall reside with the righteous and his memory will live on in generations. Mm -hmm. 